Joining us now on a CNBC exclusive here at Post 9, new CEO of Virgin Hyperloop One, Jay Walder. No stranger to major transportation projects. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. So you're looking to build the first Hyperloop One in India? Why India? Why not the U.S.? Well, we're looking at both. And so, so I, I think that's one of the things I should clarify. We have yeah. four studies underway in the U.S. right now in, in the Midwest, Ohio, uh, in Texas, Colorado, um, and in Missouri, where we actually completed the first study from about a project from St. Louis to Kansas City. Uh, tremendously exciting, and if you take that, that St. Louis project, for example, that's a trip that takes about three and a half hours right now, and it would be done in under 30 minutes. Which sounds really great. How much is it going to cost? When are we going to actually start to see these in place? Well, there's a number of steps. Look, this is a stepwise approach, and this is not just putting on a new, a new bus line or doing something of like course. that. Uh, first off, let me say that there's been a tremendous amount of technology development that's been done. Uh, when I started to look at this, that just blew me away, right? I mean, they took me out to, to Las Vegas where the, a test track has actually been built and you see this actually operating and, and, and doing it. Um, and you begin to get the sense that this is real and it can happen and, and, and it's doing it. Uh, what really needs to happen right now is to really move from the first stage of testing to really the development of real projects. The four projects I mentioned in, in the U.S., a project that we're working on in Spain, and then in, in India, where I think is a very, very exciting project from, from Mumbai uh, to Panay. Uh, a trip today that, that's about four hours apart, and we have been designated as the original project proponent for this right now, which means that, that we are starting the work on this project with the government cooperatively. We still have some more work to do in the procurement process. But I believe that we could be in construction on the, on the first loop, the first 11-kilometer test loop uh, in 2019. Jay, the controversy around this company is immense. From Chervin Pishavar, the co-founder, no longer involved with the company, Rob Lloyd, recently the CEO, now not there anymore. Richard Branson is stepping back as chairman. There was an early deal with Russia that now looks a bit more controversial than it did at the time two and a half years ago. Saudi Arabia looks like it's stepping back from its investment. Maybe you can clarify that. And then there are reports of massive layoffs as well and questions about your cash position. So Saudi first and then cash. So look, I, I think Saudi, we're, we're like any other company, we're looking at the situation in Saudi. What I'd say more generally is that I think the Middle East is a region that's very, very important for Hyperloop. Are they in or out? Can you say? Do you know? Not sure. Um, but, but the Middle East in general is a, is, a, is a great area and it's had a lot of support in terms of doing it. And the idea that Hyperloop could be knitting together the GCC is, is actually real in terms of being able to do it. We're thrilled that DP World is one of our main investors and to go to your point about funding, um, our current investors are leading this round of funding. <clears throat> DP World is, is leading that round, all of our current investors. Uh, and I'm really excited about that in terms of being able to do it. Look, there's history, no question about that. Uh, no one can, can but, but it is history. I think what you're really seeing today is the evolution of the company, the maturity of the company, the, the real pivot and development from something that says, hey, we've done fantastic tech. We'll continue to do fantastic tech. We're an incredible tech company. The, the people here blow me away. But we also have to pivot now toward, toward really being commercial, to really setting these up as real projects. And we're starting to tick off the things that say, what makes this happen and how do we do that effectively? It sounds like the potential is richer overseas than it is here at home. I think it's both, right? I mean, I, I think we have a number of projects here. I'll, I'll look, I'll tell you, I haven't started yet. Tuesday is my first day. Monday's the holiday, of course. Uh, one of my phone calls on Tuesday will be to the U.S. Secretary of Transportation because I know that USDT is really excited about what we're doing. And I want to reach out to, to Elaine Chow. I want to actually have a conversation right away and say, hey, we want to be here. This is a country where we have built everything on the idea that we take technology and we don't, we don't look to catch up. We look to leapfrog, right? That's what this is about. You have deep roots, deep roots in transportation. Are, especially now that we have midterms out of the way, are we going to get an infrastructure spending bill? Would you bet on it? I actually think so. And I think one of the things that, that I love about Hyperloop it's totally bipartisan. I, I don't know anything else right now that actually is really purple. Everybody says they're purple, but, but I think this actually is bipartisan. Look at the places around the country that we're talking about doing this right now. The idea of, of investing in technology that can create productivity, that can create jobs, that can redefine our landscape in terms of being able to do it, that can make us a more efficient, environmentally friendly country, that cuts across every line. 
And, and that's it, the beauty of this. Would it matter to you if it was funded by a bank or if it was just outright dollars? That's sort of one of the debates regarding infrastructure. You know, I, I think it's too soon to, to tell, and I think we should be flexible in the way that we're looking at all these things. Uh, what I really, really like about this is that you can make it happen and that we can get behind it in different ways. And maybe, frankly, the model in the U.S. may be a little different than the model we use in another country. Why does it have to be one size fits all? Jay Walder, thanks for joining us here. Thank you very much.